to be giving a talk, but I'll do my best. Um, thanks for coming. It's really uh, exciting to see so many of you, many of you here. Um, I also think that your posi this, the positioning is really odd. This is a late night, like, lounge thing. It's not early morning, but we'll, we'll make the best of it. Um, that's an old intro slide that shouldn't be there. Hold on. So look, this is, um, this is us, uh, me on the left, if you didn't recognize me, and it's in a, a previous guise, I shapeshift. Uh, my partners, Rick Scavidio and Liz Diller. Um, our practice is, um, as Tina mentioned, uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and a little bit crazy sometimes. Uh, we do everything from art projects, this is a thing called Vice Virtue, Vice Virtue, which are drinking glasses we made for a Dutch company. Um, you could get the gist of it, each one, uh, while uh, providing uh, water or something virtuous, has also um, a drug of choice. Um, uh, we make uh, product design, like this um, uh, lamp uh, for Zorowski. Um It comes in one lobe or two. I like the two lobes. We, we do uh, theater pieces. This is a multidisciplinary, whatever you want to call it, um, media uh, theater piece called Jet Lag that we did. We wrote the story. Um, we concocted all of the uh, staging, um, which included live time uh, video and a recorded video and, and a merger of those two things to blur the di real line of reality between um, fiction and fact and uh, live time and recorded time. We've done master plans, this is for BAM, um, and we've done uh, work at Lincoln Center, uh, completely um, transforming the public spaces of that um, venerable institution and adding on to several buildings and, and making new ones. This is the Juilliard School at Alice Tully Hall, which used to be um, a big, big, brooding, uh, brutalist building. Um, I'm going to just ease into a discussion about the High Line, uh, mostly, but uh, just show you a couple of our uh, landscape projects that were sort of precursors for uh, our work um, on the line here. Starting with the Blur Building in um, Yverdon in Switzerland. Uh, this is um, uh, Lake, Neuchatel, um, Lake Neuchatel, right, that we're on? You're Swiss, you know. <laughs> Neuchatel, up there. See that little cloud? That's, well, look at what I just did. <laughs> so, how is the pointer on this thing? Um, does it have one? In the middle? Yeah. That little cloud is the blur. That's Lake Neuchatel. We were asked to make a media pavilion for the Swiss Expo 2002, um, and because we were sort of known as media architects previously, you'd seen some media already this morning, and we decided that rather than make um, uh, something about media, we, we don't like to do as we're told usually, so we try to, to, do, to do things differently. So we wanted to make a, a pavilion, but we wanted to make a pavilion that had absolutely no technology, a very low-tech pavilion, so what we made in the end was a cloud um, that sat out on the lake and used the, the water of the lake to, to make the cloud itself. So we, we gave uh, back to Switzerland pl uh, plenty of what they already are, what they have already have plenty of. Um, this is it in its um, realized uh, manifestation. It's the size of a football field um, raised up on four legs. Um, uh, it made a trail that was sometimes half a mile long. There were cloud police that made us turn it off and down when it was getting a little out of control. Um, this is the structure. It was the largest tensegrity structure. This is a system that Buckminster Fuller uh, used uh, a lot of, uh, and other, other people um, sort of uh, have ownership of this, but we pushed it to uh, its limits. Um, uh, you, you can go out and walk on this platform, by the way, out here. This is the size of the football field. Um, it had 33,000 high-pressure fog nozzles. Um, that made uh, a constantly changing, uh, formless, uh, shape shapeless, um, uh, ephemeral piece of architecture. 
um, that uh, you could enter via these long ramps. And once you got into this piece of architecture, there was nothing to see. Um, <laughs> nothing. And, and that, was, that was kind of the point. Typically, when you make a media pavilion, it's all about verisimilitude and uh, virtuosic technologies. And rather, we wanted to do something that highlighted how dependent we are on vision and uh, our bodies and, um, and uh, relationships between people um, in, in ways that aren't mediated. Um, it was very popular. Um, it showed up on things like sugar packets, umbrellas. And um, in Switzerland, when you show up in a chocolate bar, you know that you've done something right. Um, quickly, a um, project that, we, that was right on the heels of this was um, our design for the Institute of Contemporary Art um, in Boston. Um, we were posed with the question, what should a new art museum be? And we uh, started to think about what the precedents had, be had been. And there's the Gertz collection in uh, Basel. I'll do that again for in case you missed it. What is that line in the middle of this screen? Um, okay, well, there you go. Um, so, right, uh, is, so, so we were asking the question of ourselves, should, should an art museum be um, uh, kind of a, a peacock, uh, something that's um, articulated like the, like the Bilbao, or something that's modest and lets the art take center stage? And we decided we would do something somewhere between, actually uh, completely off, off in a, a different place. Uh, that, something that uh, has quite a bit of strength in form, but also is, is quite um, simply about uh, making um, a great place for art. So the upper story of this building is the art gallery. It's all top lit. Um, and then the lower three floors are civic spaces. Essentially, they're part of the art museum, but they're made of the space uh, around the harbor where this building is located, the harbor walk. The wood was pulled up into, the, into, the, into a grandstand and into a theater. Uh, the theater is completely glass. Um, uh, that would be cut, so the surface of the harbor walk becomes the material of the museum, uh, democratic surface uh, leading into a civic uh, building. Um, the elevator was large enough to put a car in, um, and then once you get out on uh, up to the, to the gallery floors uh, floor, there's one moment where you're pushed out to the edge, uh, overlooking the the water in a very precipitous uh, fashion, um, and then. Uh, a, a space called the Media Tech uh, that re, um, reframes uh, your relationship to the site by eliminating the horizon line uh, through through a dip down space. This is where they show all of their their media. That's Lincoln Center. One more time, um, these were additions and changes to Lincoln Center, which were in essence about turning the entire um, community of the of that place uh, inside out, showing things. Uh, that were going on on the inside to the outside for the very first time uh, through, through um, moves like putting this giant glass wall. Um, the Tully Hall was made with one single log, uh, really thin veneer, it actually glows from behind. Uh, the North Plaza, we added that pavilion that, that you see in the background which has a lawn on it, so it's a doubly functioning piece of architecture. Um, and underneath it is a, a restaurant called Lincoln. Um, so again, sort of a um, public uh, democratic surface above uh, and um, uh, a, a slightly more um, elite um, uh, institution below. Um, the steps at Lincoln Center were turned into a marquee, sort of a, a marquee on the ground as opposed to in the air. They have LED uh, in them, um, new canopies of glass, 85 foot long. Um, it's become much more of a hangout. I don't know if any of you go up there, but, um, but you should. Um, the fountain was remade very subtly. It's one of New York City's uh, most famous landmarks, but, uh, uh, and it remains um, very much like it was, except not. It's completely different. And then we've, we've been um, interested in landscape, um, and that's going to lead into discussion of the High Line. Um, I'm trying to keep track of time because I have a meeting starting at 10 at my office. So, okay, we're 10 minutes through the presentation. Fine, no problem. So this is a project that we did in Liverpool um, for, for their biennial. Everybody seems to have a biennial these days. Um, and um, uh, we were uh, asked to do a public uh, uh, artwork in, in the city. And we took over a park and made a grove of trees, three of which um, are on these turntables. Um, and uh, they're, they're tipped a little bit. Um, 
and they have the grass on them, as you can see. Um, and I, I like to think about um, um, the, the, the blokes coming out of a pub, um, sort of slightly tipsy and um, encountering these uh, happy trees, as we call them, um, spinning away. So that actually has some sound. Oh, well, you missed it. Um, <laughs> So we've been interested in landscape, and, and um, more importantly, the merger of landscape and architecture, um, something like this room, but not. Um, and uh, the High Line is uh, our first uh, park project to be completed. Um, and I actually like to think of it not as a park at all, but in fact as a, a viewing apparatus uh, for the city of New York. It's, 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 um, it's got green on it, of course, um, but it really is about repositioning your body and your eyes and your mind um, within the city. Um, the line was constructed in uh, the early 30s um, uh, along uh, the, w the west side of Manhattan. It's 1.5 miles now. It was longer than that before. Um, and it replaced uh, a train line which was on the ground, which was uh, called the train of death um, because the train would uh, run, constantly run people over. It went down 10th Avenue. Um, and it was, it was how all of the food, or a lot of New York City's food was brought in. So this line was made uh, to transport um, uh, edibles. Um, this is the length of the line, it's 1.5 miles. It goes from Gansport Street all the way up to the Hudson Yards. Um, it did go further south. Um, and this is what it looked like prior to the renovation. Um, I've been in New York for some years and I had broken into the High Line, uh, sort of you weren't supposed to, but, but you did do this. Um, and uh, there were many you know, events up there, um, illegal events. And when you got up there, um, what you found was this, this amazing um, natural uh, verdant um, ecology uh, that was self-sustaining uh, and, and constantly changing. Um, the result of airborne seeds uh, landing in um, scant uh, dirt that, fell, that uh, collected between the rocks um, and some foreign seeds and other, or foreign plants that were brought by the trains and deposited as produce was uh, brought through. But everything that grew up here grew naturally without any maintenance, and that's what it looked like. Um, so those of us that had been up there knew that this was a magic place, rarefied uh, in, in, in New York City, um, unlike any place in the world, frankly. And um, when Friends of the High Line, oh, and here, here, here we are, busting in. That's what you had to do. I, I, went to, I went to a friend's birthday party, and I had to crawl through a sheet metal fence like this. And I got up there, and there were cocktail waiters in tuxedos with martinis and glasses <laughs> walking down over the dead rats and the crushed uh, grass, at glass. Anyway, it was, it's magic, and um, uh, when we were... Uh, when Friends of the High Line finally got a stay of execution, which is really what it amounted to, from um, the Giuliani administration because Bloomberg came in, uh, and one of the first acts he did was to, to prevent it from being torn down, um, Friends of the High Line generated a lot of income uh, to help preserve it, and they held several competitions, one an ideas competition, and then later, um, a competition um, which we participated with field operations uh, as a team against um, Stephen Hall and Zaha Hadid and Dirt Studios with Michael von Valkenberg. And our primary um, motivation, I guess, or one of, one of several, but one really important one was that we didn't want this place to be commercial and to have any form of um, you know, kind of uh, national commerce. So, uh, and, and rather, we wanted it to be um, very particular uh, to, to New York City and speak to the other, to, to, the, to, to the one 1% that the other parks don't speak to. Um, uh, and we developed uh, a system um, to build the park out uh, that we t like to talk about as agritecture. It's a merger of green and hard, of concrete and grass. Um, which took uh, as its starting point the existing line um, and uh, the way that the weeds grew through the ballast um, and around the tracks and across the ties. Um, so we're taking our clue right from the, the, the found condition of the line itself um, and generating a new system um, that, um, it, much like our blur, can morph and change and, and cover the entire 
uh, the entire track bed or uh, go into a tiny path, but most importantly, it has no edges, no definition. Uh, green can grow in, into the cracks. I'm sure you've all been there. Um, it can be completely paved or completely uh, green. Um, this is the Gansevoort entrance. You can see that it's cut. That was one of the cuts that was um, uh, performed in the 80s. Um, and we left it as a cut, exposed with a piece of glass that, that um, ex exposes the, um, the soil, the planting material of the trees at the end. Um, we were very keen on bringing uh, the industrial nature of the line uh, into close contact with people who go there. So rather than entering it on the outside and, and, and hopping into the line, we wanted you to cut right through uh, the, the girders and joists so that you could be very close up to this heavy, um, massive uh, steel system. And then once you get on top, uh, the agriculture system with its fingers that allow for plants to grow through uh, becomes evident. This was the opening year. It's gotten much lusher since then. Um, the line has amazing moments where it uh, kisses and penetrates um, other buildings. Um, kissing and penetrating. Um, and, <laughs> and has incredible moments of um, adjacency to other streets um, and to buildings. Um, uh, that are crumbling and that are new, um, but it's um, it provides it's a new kind of, of urban space um, in the world. There are a couple of other uh, raised parks. There's one in Paris that you might know, but it has a very different approach and and uses the city in a very different way. It tend, those tend to cloister themselves off from the city. We're actually uh, taking all of our um, energy from the city. We wanted the system that we developed, the agriculture system, to be responsible for all of the elements of the line. So here you can see how the concrete uh, peels up and, and, and uh, fingers into wood benches. Um, this is from taken from the standard, looking down. Um, and we wanted to reuse elements of the line, such as the rail tracks. Uh, here, this lounge at 14th Street um, takes the old rail tracks and we made new lounge chairs using rail car wheels. Um, they've since been locked down because kids were getting their fingers caught between them, but basically the idea is you can roll all of these lounge chairs together, um, there are the wheels, um, and make an urban uh, bench uh, or bed, uh, whatever you want to do with that. Um, it's become very popular in all seasons. Um, this is that same moment. Um, there's a water feature that um, trickles uh, over, the, over the concrete planks um, just north of 14th Street. Uh, this uh, penetration through uh, the Chelsea Market we made really exciting uh, with a, a light installation and Spencer Finch's um, uh, portrait of the Hudson uh, with several hundred panes of uh, glass um, colored to be the colors of the Hudson. Um, and we're very interested in the way, as I said, this element, the High Line, works in the city and frames the city differently. And, and there are several moments where we took advantage of existing infrastructure um, to make um, new kinds of experiences um, uh, that are theatrical, both from inside the line but also from outside the line. So here, this giant 12-foot uh, uh, high girder that we cut holes in and made a theater at 10th Avenue. Um, so that you can uh, watch the cars uh, pass by. Um, it's a, a theater of the banal, um, trying to, uh, this is what you see, um, just uh, traffic going down 10th Avenue. Um, and you'd think that would be really uninteresting, and yet um, people hang out there. There it is. Um, uh, the park uh, was planted by Piet Udolf, who's a, a botanist based out of uh, the Netherlands. Um, he did a masterful job making uh, the planting both um, sustainable and ecologically sound for this region, taking advantage of the microclimates of the line, moments where there are shadows, uh, where there are uh, crevasses, valleys. The planting was uh, determined by these microclimates. It was also um, planted to be in bloom for 10 months of the year, 
which is incredible. And when it's not in bloom, it's spectacularly beautiful dead. <laughs> so it's quite beautiful in the fall. Um, this is again a year ago, and then phase two, um, which is uh, only 22 feet wide for the, for the most part, actually um, is lusher. And we tried to make phase two, which is from 20th Street North, um, be more intimate and give you more um, personal moments of repose um, and uh, thought thoughtful engagement with the city here on the fly, the woodland flyover, uh, the, uh, this bridge system that passes over a uh, completely planted section of the line um, and breaks off into spurs that have seating elements in them. Um, these are, it's a different kind of experience. And then I just want to talk about the, the kind of residual effects of the line. Um, w we all know that uh, different things happen up there, um, such as weddings. Um, this has uh, um, become fairly commonplace uh, to see weddings, which we love. Um, in the first uh, couple summers that uh, the, the line was open, uh, there were performances, impromptu performances on 20th Street. Um, by this cabaret singer who got out on her stoop uh, or her fire escape and serenaded uh, visitors. Um, there she is. Um, really cool. Um, and uh, there have been uh, marching bands. Um, there's art up there, um, which is really great. Uh, there's, a, um, there's a dance uh, club from, um, I think they're called the Brooklyn Steppers or something like that. Um, just uh, taking over on that grandstand in this uh, phase two. And then there are all the other kinds of activities that happen around the line, um, which uh, are, 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 are just sort of, in a way, urban activities that have been put into relief or framed differently by the line. Um, and, uh, and here, um, uh, we're, we're talking about, of course, the now uh, famous um, uh, Standard Hotel um, you know, strip tease moment where um, it is rumored that uh, Andre Balazs, the owner of the hotel, was encouraging guests and um, uh, uh, workers to put on shows for people on the line down below. Um, and, then, and then there's the residual effect uh, that the line uh, had in the city um, where uh, development has increased um, exponentially around the line. When we first started working on it, uh, there were no new buildings in West Chelsea. Uh, now there are more than 80 condo projects either built or underway, um, and hotels, and it's become uh, the foremost repository of star-architected buildings, um, including uh, Neil Denari, Jean Nouvel, uh, Shigeru Ban, all you see those names there. Um, so uh, uh, it's, it's a who's who uh, in the world of architecture, um, all sort of clinging to um, or attached to the spine uh, of the line itself. And there's the Nouvelle. Um, uh, here is the, um, uh, this is uh, Delavalle um, uh, Bernheimer. Um, this is uh, 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 Matlock. Oh, this is, uh, now I'm not going to say who these are. Neil Denari, uh, this is a really fantastic building, I think. Frank Gehry, um, Shigeru Ruban, and Annabelle Seldorf. Um, that's a pretty cool project, uh, by the way, the Shutter House. Um, uh, and this is Della Valle Bernheimer as well. Um, uh, that's work AC. That's Diane von Furstenberg's bedroom, by the way. You can probably see her in there. That's not a nice looking building. Um, I'm going to quickly go through those. And then, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about with the highlight, and it's just fun things to think about, are the copycat projects that are happening all over the world. Uh, so in Milwaukee. Um, Literally, someone took the images, I mean, of our paving um, going into uh, the, the, the concrete in Philadelphia. These are all projects that have started since um, the High Line was open. Chicago, Jersey, uh, St. Louis, Mexico City, Toronto, uh, Los Angeles, um, Atlanta. This is, these are all sort of rails to trails. Um, movement. And then finally, um, there's a sort of anti-copycat, the sort of low lines underground, subterranean cavern, cis cistern, um, that is uh, going to be turned into a park. I'm going to stop there so we have a chance for Q&A. Um, I have so many more slides. I've got about 500 slides in here. <laughs> but, uh, but I think I'll, I'll, um, I'll open it up. I think we have 10 minutes. I'm going to hop out of here in, in not so long. What are the questions?
Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, oh, okay, thanks. I was like, oh, it's a quiz. Anybody? Hi, back there. Okay, uh, the question is what color socks do we like to wear in the morning? Um, I wear multicolored socks. No, um, it's, uh, that's a, I mean, it's a good question. What, what, what do you do? I mean, what, how do you tackle problems? You're all in the creative field. You, uh, you try to figure out what the problem is. There's always a problem, and if, you, if, you, if the problem isn't obvious, you make a problem. We are in the problem making, <laughs> we're in the problem making business. Um, and so every, every project has a problem to be solved, and we usually develop it for ourselves. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, a film project, a dance piece, a building, uh, an, a, an installation on wine in San Francisco. Um, we just drill down into the problem. That's how we start everything. Next question. Yes. You're talking about me personally or our firm? Well, that person got it wrong. No, I mean, I've, uh, I've done um, a whole bunch of things personally before I joined uh, Diller and Scovideo in 97. Um, I had my own practice. I, I, did, um, I worked with Ralph Applebaum. We did in, uh, mu interactive museum design. Um, I've done, uh, since I've been with Liz and Rick, I've done uh, dance pieces and various other things. Um, I mean, look, I think, uh, you know, in a way we make fictions uh, out of everything that we do. Um, and, and, or, or, we, or we thread together reality and fiction into a new c creation. And I think theater is a place where we've explored that um, to, to a, a more heightened degree. Um, that jet lag piece, for instance, which is live time, uh, some of the cast members sit in the audience. I mean, that's sort of an old trick now. Um, and and, uh, and, and um, pre-produced video. And there's a merger of those kinds of things. Um, so I think, you know, all of our projects benefit from some of the research and exploration that we've done uh, in the theater world, um, where you've got a captive audience, just like you. Um, you, can, you, know, you can deliver things from one particular point of view uh, in time that you control. Um, and we like to think about how that works in building and architectures. And Highland's a great example. It unfolds over time. Um, there's not exactly a climax, but there's a delivery um, of, um, of, of experiences which are atomized over time and space. Um, that, but that work in the end very much like a piece of theater. In fact, we're going to, do I have these in here? We're about to start um, uh, developing an opera that will take place on the High Line and over uh, the length of the High Line. Yes? What do you find most inspiring? What color socks do I wear? Is that what you said? No. Um, what do I find most inspiring? Oh, God, that's, I mean, that, what do you find inspiring? Amazing what? Couture dress. I'm a fashion designer. Oh, really? Okay. Spectacular yeah. I, yeah, I love that show. That was really incredible uh, to see that work. Um, look, I think inspiration happens everywhere, here and there. Um, there's not, not one particular thing. What really gives you juice? Um, a great bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> um... Let's see what gives me what gives me juice. Look, I think uh, I think when when we see things that are that were not intended for us to see, when we make connections, you know, d on a daily basis, walking down the street, um, those are those are the moments that are exciting. Uh, not necessarily the, the moments that uh, people give you or push onto you. And I, I say that it's a funny thing for me to say because we make cultural. Um, projects that we push on to people and we expect them to uh, to engage them in particular ways uh, but in a way I think it's the found moments uh, the ones that you discover um, in in the city especially that that are truly exciting I also like um, peering into people's apartments <laughs> or the standard hotel. sorry or the standard hotel. exactly exactly 
Other quick question. You were talking, you were showing the cloud about how you rarely have to do with a call. Yeah. Um, I mean, it depends uh, on what you're trying to sell them. Um, first off, I don't think that we're snake oil salespeople. I think that we actually are making things that are legitimate and, and interesting. And I think that if you just simply talk about what the ideas that are going into something and what you're trying to do with it, it sort of sells itself, even if it's something that hadn't been thought of by uh, the client. I mean, you know, somebody comes to you to, and asks you to do something, they don't want what they can already imagine, right? And But they'll tell you that's what they want, and then it's up to you to go and say, what do they really want? Or what do we want You know, out of, out of this? What, what is our problem? Um, and then usually you can start from where they, the, what they gave us, take a little you know, a, a tour of ideas from that point, and end up where you end up. And, and by the time you're done, they're going, oh, that makes total sense. A cloud with 33,000 fog nozzles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, a couple more questions I could take. Uh, yes, in front here. <laughs> that is not modeling. That was, uh, that was definitely not modeling. Um, no, they have a really pretty interesting se series of uh, real life um, advertising uh, campaigns. Am I a sellout? Do you think? I mean. <laughs> I actually, I actually worry about that. Um, you what? I think they're a good company, and and they did not pay me to say what I'm about to say. But that Ludlow suit, if you get it tailored, is really spiffy. <laughs> they didn't even pay me to say that. But um, anyway, so um, but but I I appreciate. Uh, well, look, we're all in collusion with you know we're we're all working for the man, um, somehow. So. Next question. <laughs> Way back there. Um, how much does your firm work with other firms that are developing directly on the high line, such as the Whitney? Uh, you mean, how, how, do, how, how do we interface with other buildings that are going on the high line? Is that what that is? Do you have any input like, in their design process because they're running up against the high line? Yeah, we do a little bit. We definitely meet with, uh, we've met with the Whitney and um, you know chat with them. We don't impact their design at all, but we, we make suggestions and tell them what they can and can't do. There are a set of fairly um, complicated rules about how you can touch the line, um, and you can't unless you provide an elevator and bathrooms, um, which the Whitney does. In fact, that's, that is our, going to be our elevator at the, at the southern end of the line when it opens. Um, no, but we're very, you know, we're, it's, it's a very collaborative um, uh, Place. Friends of the High Line have made friends with everyone. They're, they're actually yummy people. Um, they, they're really nice to work with. Um, and uh, I think everybody wants to um, be included in a discussion around uh, what, th what they can and can't do. Over here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the um, uh, the Navy Yards uh, around there is a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, uh, Governor's Island is fascinating. We actually participated, in, and I guess we're on the team, the winning team, to redo it. But uh, there's so much that could happen there. Um, if you haven't been out, it's really incredible. Um, Red Hook was the, uh, an object of des or a, a neighborhood of desire for quite a while. Um, if you haven't been out there, it's really incredible. Uh, light um, because it's actually a peninsula that goes into the water. Um, I mean, New York is full of places that that um, have potential, but also have charm the way they are um, falling apart. In fact, I sort of miss uh, the decrepit New York um, that existed where the High Line is now. When I moved here in the '80s, um, that uh, was full of uh, transvestite uh, drug dealers. Um, I mean, it was, re but it was really exciting and fun. Um, 
So, we don't need to convert everything. We don't need to get our little paws on everything and make it all shiny. Um, uh, some things are be better left the way they are, in a way. More question here? Sure. We're um, right now. We're about 75 people total. Um, we've we've expanded this past year. We've doubled in size, actually, which is kind of incredible. Um, and it's hard to grow that fast. And I guess that's you know part of your question is, well, how do you maintain a studio environment uh, of an art studio, which is how Liz and Rick started the practice 35 years ago, and how we. When I came, there were only six of us, total four of us, actually, um, two, two other people, and Liz, Rick, and me. And it's grown to a practice of 75, yet we still, um, it's still pretty open. Uh, I don't know if any of you know people that work there. I'm sure you do. Um, and you get stories that probably contradict what I'm about to say, but um, uh, it is a very, it's a sort of an open source studio. Um, as we've grown, we've had to put some more stricture uh, on our, our structure on uh, the way the, the process works. But in general, we encourage people to bring ideas to the table. We discuss them. We spend a lot of energy um, around everybody's ideas, probably more than we should. Um, we probably don't make enough, make as much money as we could if we just sort of bulldozed through, but uh, that's really part of the point of the studio, is is trying to let the problem, to make the problem emerge, I mean really, is what it is. What is the problem and how do we want to solve it? And, and sometimes you have to, it's really iterative and you have to go through um, many ideas and many people's ideas uh, to get there. Um, but anyway, we're, you know, at, we're trying to figure out how to con continue that. Um, in fact, the reason I'm going, have to leave now is because I'm going to um, an organizational meeting about the way the office is structured. Um, and, uh, and, and, lo and look, one of, the, one of the principals is gone. Um, but uh, anyway, it's, it's interesting. It's all, never, never a dull moment, I'll say that, um, these days there. Any, anybody else? I'm gonna take one more and then I'm gonna, gonna have to run. Or not. Oh, one more. You don't seem to shy away from like you know difficult projects, and I was wondering if there is there anything that you turn down because it's too difficult or never. Never. <laughs> we don't turn down projects. That yeah. I mean, that bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> the harder, the better. So anyway, uh, thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>